that's really good. Um, so I'm, I'm really, really happy. This is the first Sonic Speaker Series uh, event for this year, I think, for the second of the year, if I'm not mistaken. Am I right, Karma? That's one, right? And uh, it's also a real pleasure for me to get a chance to be able to talk and introduce our guest today because um, Hank is one of those cases where I didn't really need to go up and read up on his bio because I kind of know it really well. <laughs> um, and Hank um, was has a long history. He's, he's an anthropologist by training, and then he did a postdoc at uh, the University of Illinois. And that's where I first got to meet him, and he worked at the Sonic Lab. In fact, he worked at the Sonic Lab when we decided to call it the Sonic Lab. So he was part of the christening time where we first came up with this name Sonic. So it's, uh, it's, uh, he's been there at the start of all this, and he's been a regular friend after spending time at Illinois in 2007. Uh, he moved to Rand uh, in Santa Monica and uh, built a really good reputation and portfolio working in the area of health communication there and has been uh, very active in this area and continues to consult and do a lot of really good research in this area. In fact, our projects here, the area of health have benefited when I, we needed help on how to do work and collect data collection in places like Africa. The first person that I would go to was uh, Hank to get his guidance, etc. on this. And I'm very happy that Hank has found his way back to the Midwest and after serving as a research, uh, as a tenured research scientist at Indiana University, he now faculty at the School of Public Health at, at IU, and so it gives me immense pleasure and also some degree of pride to welcome back to have Hank give a talk as part of the Sonic series, and you see the title of his talk there, so thank you, Hank, and welcome back. Yeah. Um, well, I'm super thrilled to be able to be here and talk to you guys, too, and um, Nash correctly said that I, were, I was, for two years, a, a T32, uh, NIH T32 uh, postdoc working with Stan Wasserman and Larry Hubert on sort of network statistics and then um, moved into working in Nash's lab as a research scientist working on big problems of application of network science in, in a bunch of different areas. Um, and um, truly, I don't believe that I would be where I was if I hadn't learned all the lessons about doing networks research that I had that I learned from working with Nash. I never worked so hard on so many different projects than I did when I was with him. Some of you may know what that feels like. Um, but it was a great benefit and has, has, has been um, incredibly useful. So um, recognize this for, if you're, if you're working with Nash in any capacity, recognize this for the great opportunity that it is, despite the fact that you may grumble every time you wake up very early in the morning to get to work out. Um, so, let's see, I forgot how to drive. Um, just to clear things up, I am not this Hank Green, um, but I get his emails all the time, still. Um, this started when he was, when he first started doing YouTube videos about math and science, people started emailing me thinking they were emailing him. Um, and so I now have his personal email address so that I can forward him the relevant ones um, and giggle about the crazy ones. So I'm not him. Um, I wish that I could get some of his, uh, his royalties from his book, though. So I'm going to talk to you about network-based strategies for improving PrEP availability among those at high risk for HIV. This is uh, sort of the first of the big final presentations from an R34 that I've been working on, so a secondary data analysis that uses medical claims data to help us um, infer physician networks and then use those physician networks to assess what we think will be effective strategic health communications for finding ways to encourage physicians to prescribe PrEP more. Uh, just to set the... Um, just to set the context, uh, despite great progress, I think many of you that are in this room that I recognize because we work in the, in the HIV world, HIV remains a pressing public health threat within the United States, particularly young racial, racial gender and sexual minorities. Um, this is a map that is based on HIV diagnoses in 2016 because the data, the claims data that we're using are from 2016. And what we decided that we wanted to do was just sort of present the various quartiles of the state. So, or present the states relative to the quartiles that they're in with respect to level of HIV diagnoses. And 
the idea is, <clears throat> not surprisingly, we see uh, big problems in the south, in California, and in the, in the northeast, where we have a lot of the big metropolitan areas um, outside the south. Um, Pre-exposure prophylaxis, on the other hand, is um, effective but underutilized at preventing HIV, right? We believe that it's primarily due to a lack of familiarity with PrEP treatment regimes among healthcare professionals that see, uh, that serve the most at-risk communities. Um, and some of that is because NIH guidelines were initially that you need to see an infectious disease specialist in order to be prescribed PrEP and go through some, some sort of fairly extensive intakes. Um, that changed. Those, those guidelines changed, allowing general practitioners and other primary care physicians to provide pre-exposure prophylaxis, but they didn't know about it. And Gilead didn't really, um, Gilead started sort of detailing um, Truvada for PrEP to infectious disease specialists who were already treating HIV, but didn't really detail to primary care physicians or other kind of care providers. So they don't really know anything, they didn't really know very much about it, particularly in 2016. So, these are the areas of high and low PrEP prescribing, with blue being lowest and red being the highest. And then if we cross those things, we get a sort of strategic map of places where we have um, higher, than, higher than the median um, HIV cases, higher than the median PrEP prescribing, lower than the median, right? And so the red is places where there's higher than the median HIV diagnoses, but lower PrEP prescribing. The green ones, it's basically like a, like a stop sign here. The green ones are places where we have fairly low HIV and, but higher than median PrEP prescribing, just to give us an idea of where things are going. Now, this data is at the state level. We've actually done these analyses at the county level, but providing a county level map of the United States really doesn't do anything but confuse. I mean, like, it's just too much detail for this. So. Underlying um, our argument is that effective PrEP programs should have appropriate availability, people should have adequate access, and then people should be, sh should be using PrEP appropriately. Um, most of the interventions and most of the funding in, that goes into developing interventions works on sort of the areas of access and utilization from the point of view of the patient, right? We're looking at mostly patient-centered HIV interventions. And my argument has always been, and this comes from a background in sort of food security and international food aid, that if you don't actually have the PrEP in your area or a doctor that will give you PrEP, it doesn't matter how willing you are to take it and how much fidelity you'll have to the regime because if you if you, if you don't have access to it, you can't use it. So our analyses and our sort of a project is aimed at targeting PrEP access from the provider side. Right. Um, our argument continues to say that we're going to have a, we're going to need to do a diverse set of things to encourage physicians to start, to start prescribing PrEP, right? So first they need to know about it. Um, they need to be working in communities where there's high enough level of HIV prevalence or incidence that it is relevant for them to know about it and they have patients that they need to prescribe. Um, we also need to make sure that they have uh, sort of, that we're, far, that we're fighting stigma, right? We need to deal with the kind of stigma that's associated in many areas with gender and sexual minorities or with people who are injection drug users or sex workers, right? Because this is problematic. And despite the fact that we hope that physicians have an objective approach to providing medical care, I think many of us understand that that's not always the case. And so we need to continue working on those too. And of course we need to address other social and cultural factors. And because I am a networks researcher and because I believe that what your colleagues do has an impact on what you do professionally, I also think that we need to assess issues of social influence, communication networks, and diffusion of innovation in trying to encourage people to adopt this new medical innovation, right? So we know a lot about how social influence and social learning work from the patient perspective because we've been doing that sort of uptake, testing, prevention, research for years and years and years. But we know very little in the context of HIV prevention about physician behavior. Um, and, and that's sort of where this comes in, where this project comes in. Please don't hesitate to stop, if you, stop me if you have questions.
Um, I'm happy to talk about this for as long as you want to talk about it, um, but I would rather it be more interactive than, than me lecture at you. But the goals for the project were to um, essentially, if, we th if we're thinking about this in terms of a sort of dyadic perspective, we want to identify providers who serve populations at high risk for HIV, but who prescribe PrEP infrequently. So we believe that those would be great targets for health communication interventions. So those are the people that we want to figure out who they are so that we can better target them. But then we also want to try to figure out if there are providers who are likely to influence the behavior of those low prescribers by virtue of where they are in the network, the kind of behaviors that they're, that they're doing. Are they, prescribe, are they treating HIV patients? Are they pre prescribing PrEP? What are they doing that's going to influence the behavior of their peers, right? And I don't know if any of you have any background in trying to get, in anthropology we always call this interviewing elites. Um, interviewing elites like doctors and politicians is always very difficult because they very rarely have the time or the interest in sitting down to do a detailed survey. And so collecting primary data from a national level network study of physicians to determine whether or not social influence would be operative in the context of, of sort of adopting this new behavior would be problematic. <clears throat> and given the sort of what I believe to be a, a, a pretty um, critical need for us to understand how to get physicians prescribing more, more PrEP as fast as possible. Our question was, what's the, you know, how can we do this with existing data? So when sure. you say providers here, mm -hmm. do you mean the pharmaceutical providers? Or? No, here I mean medical care providers, so it doesn't necessarily have to be a physician, but it could be a nurse practitioner, or a physician's assistant. Um, so we, we, we sort of assume that on the supply side everything is fine. So we're, we're not thinking about availability from the context of are the pharmaceutical corporations um, doing this. One of the things that is an open question for us is whether or not the information about PrEP should come from Gilead or whether or not it should come from colleagues who are actually doing the prescribing on the ground. Because there's a difference, right. I think, in, in sort of expectations and in, and in sort of um, the, amount of, the amount that people value the information that's coming from somebody who's seen as a, a drug representative versus somebody who's actually using it. We want to use this, we, we, we propose to use medical claims data to assess these issues, right? So the aims that we proposed were to construct a provider-to-provider -provider network relevant to the population indicated for PrEP using claims data. The claims data that we, I'll, I'll give you more details about the data, but basically a medical claim has information about the patient, it has information about the physician, it has information about the medical condition that's been treated and it has information about how it was treated and whether or not there was anything prescribed, right? Um, we want to test alternative hypotheses for processes that might drive PrEP prescription rates. Things like do they know about PrEP? Do they have colleagues that are prescribing PrEP? Um, are there cultural differences that vary by region, right? And then we want to use the structure of this network developed in name one and the results of analyses in AIM-2 to sort of test and simulate interventions in AIM-3, right? So we're basically building a database, running a bunch of models on the database, and then using the results of those models to test what we believe are good possibilities for delivering this health communication. Now, I should point out that we're not planning on developing the content of the interventions because we feel like there are people that are better at developing sort of continuing medical education and, and information about prescribing regimes and so on and so forth than we are. What we're trying to talk about are the various modes that the information could be delivered through. So the primary data set that we, that we um, sort of applied to the NIH to, to buy and use, uh, it comes from Symphony Health and it's a pharmacy claims data set that contains data from 2016 and 2017. And of course, at the national level, you're talking about 
millions and millions, if not billions of particular claims. And so we needed to, to trim that down a little bit in order for us to, to be able to work on it. And so what we decided to ask them for was all of the data that we believe somehow indicated the treatment of a sexually active adult population. So we said, we would like the data from all the claims for physicians who have treated some sort of STD in their practice, right? And so this eliminates like pediatricians to some extent, this eliminates um, uh, radiologists, this eliminates a lot of specialists who wouldn't be dealing with sort of sexual health related issues and sort of helps us narrow down the playing field. And what we decided to do was to say, we want people that are treating HIV, we want people that are treating herpes, we want people that are treating syphilis, we want people that are treating gonorrhea and chlamydia. Things that were very clear that we can find in the prescription claims data. Some of that was easier than others, right? We asked them for hepatitis C treatments too, but the number of additional claims that we were gonna get for adding hepatitis C treatment to it we didn't feel like was worth the additional cost that they added on for them to, to add those cases to it for us. It basically essentially doubled the cost of the data. And the cost of the data was more than a single year's funding for the R34. We basically gave up a year's worth of funding in order to just buy the data. Um, which, if you know anything about working with inside an NIH budget is very difficult. Um, hard enough as it is. Um, so we take this pharmacy data and we map provider networks and then quantify prescribing behavior using this de-identified claims data. So there's no information about, from, from the claims data that we bought, there's no information aside from a patient like unique ID number that is, that is linked across all of the different patients or across all the different physicians uh, for, the, for the patients themselves. But we do have information on, um, on the physicians so that we can link to their, um, to their MPI, right? And we can figure out what their specialty is and where they're located. Claims data come from all payer sources, including private insurers, Medicare and Medicaid. A lot of the other claims data sources that you can get really are only for insured patients and don't include Medicare and Medicaid. So that's one benefit of using this particular group. The problem with it is that we can only get the pharmacy data. We can't actually get medical, um, trying to say procedures. Um, but this is, this is one of those things where um, a lot of times what we had to say was, can we get what we need from the data that we have, rather than trying to push for something that might be more expensive or more detailed, right? <clears throat> so um, that's all, I think that's all fairly clear and I've covered most of it. But then we also integrated other data sources, right? So we included information from the CDC and from AIDSview about HIV prevalence and incidence. We also included information from AIDSview about PrEP use in 2016. Um, PrEP costs information came from NASDAQ and from Veracred. We actually directly assessed Veracred, or we worked with Veracred directly to get information about the cost of PrEP per patient. Um, we, we gathered information from the Pew Research Center for opinions on homosexuality, opinions on HIV. We also had um, information about the number of infect, uh, injection drug users uh, that existed in areas because we were trying to think about ways to assess regional variations in the population and sort of attitudes towards the high risk groups that were, that would be using, that would be using PrEP, right? Once again, these are not the only data sources that we could have used. There are so many more. And we, we probably evaluated somewhere between 100 and 150 sources and had to reject many of them that we would love to have used for their reputation because they didn't have the granularity that we needed in order to make our analyses work. So there was this fine balance that had to be drawn between what can we get? What are people willing to give us? What has the appropriate granularity in the area that we need for it to work on so that we can actually do the analyses that we need to do? Yeah. So I don't know whether or not you know how the, how the GSS works, but the GSS is a nationally representative sample, but there aren't people 
interviewed in every state or in every county, right? So they can do a 2,000 person survey and give you an ex a sort of assessment of what they think things, you know, things are, attitudes are like at a state level, but we couldn't get it down to the level of the county, right? We needed to know at least down to the level of the county in order for there to be appropriate variation, at least we felt, for it to be of any use. So what are our methods? Obviously, we first had to make networks. We inferred the networks from shared patients. Uh, we know from previous research that these networks are strongly predictive of diffusion of medical practices and that the shared patient networks generally tend to um, echo communication networks. They may not be perfect, but better than, better than chance, right, in terms of expectations, probably much better than chance, right? Uh, and like I said before, we limited our claims to providers who see sexually active patients. Um, syphilis and gonorrhea turned out to be too generalized for us to use because the treatments are also used for many, many, many other things. The way that we were able to sort of back ourselves into it because there are some sort of unique combinations of treatments that are used to treat these bacterials. But generally the viral uh, sexually transmitted infections were easy, easier for us to assess because there are single drugs often that are used to treat that or single families of drugs, right? So once we created the networks, which was no small feat and included having to put these networks together uh, initially at state by state and then join them um, for sort of cross state connections and then analyze them. And we went from working on a laptop to working on a sort of small analysis machine in someone's office to now to then working on the small HPC it ran to now working on the largest HPC cluster that RAND has in order to handle these, these data. Um, fairly simple analyses, obviously, we did, de we did degree between this eigenvector centrality, we did some measures of local clustering, transitive closure, so on and so forth. Um, we did some community detection, though community detection on a network of that size is very computationally intensive and ultimately didn't give us very much information over and above sort of individual local position. You may, have, you may be going to say the stage wrong, but what was the size? I'm going to say it in this. I'll let you know. Okay. Um, and so then we added the publicly available data and then we ran these statistical models. And we did lag regressions to predict the number of PrEP prescriptions written in 2017, accounting for level of prescribing in 2016. Because we felt like that was the best way for us to account for sort of some endogeneity effects associated with the physicians themselves. So after that, where we are right now is we're in the process of assessing these intervention mechanisms. We're thinking about what the mechanisms are going to be. We're using, we're using Tom Valenti's work on network-based interventions and Tom's work on diffusion of innovation among other people's work on diffusion of innovation. And also looking at um, sort of frameworks that are given in implementation science in the context of medical care to determine what we think are gonna be appropriate interventions for us to use. Um, it's actually my homework, and as soon as I get done with this talk, I have to go and finish doing my homework, which is to then give a framework that links the strategies to um, the relevant uh, parameters and the models that we have in order for them to do some prediction and to do some simulation. So we're doing some sort of, we're using the lag models to do some prediction to see what happens if we adjust some of the parameters in the, in, the, in the regression models. But then we're also using Tom's net diffuse R package to assess what happens if we seed the network with sort of prep change agents with varying specialties, with varying numbers, with varying locations within the network in order to see how that affects the diffusion of, of prep prescribing through the network as well. So we're doing some network diffusion models in addition to using network informed regressions to figure out what we think are gonna be the most effective. And then finally, we're gonna talk to doctors to see what they think is gonna be the most effective. And then based on that, we're gonna come up with a series of recommendations for what we think they might like to do. I'm gonna run through some of these pretty quickly. We had all these grand ideas about what hypotheses we were going to test, and this comes out of our proposal. This is like what we thought we were gonna do. Um, if any of you have any sort of background in, in, in how things go from the proposal to implementation, most of these 
are there, but in slightly different form based on what data we could get and what truly ended up working out. So we had ideas that geographic variation was going to be important, and so we, we sort of gave our hypothesis and then gave an example of what an intervention could be like. And the idea was to just assess the likelihood of us being able to come up with interventions that were associated with it. And then we translated that into what we thought the functional form would be. We thought that we would be able to, to predict the number of PrEP prescriptions, but in 2016 and 2017, the number of PrEP prescriptions is so zero inflated and so low that truly it turns into a logistic question. Do they or do they not? Because there are so few people that are very heavy prescribers. Right? And then we have things that are associated with the patient profile of the of the physicians or the medical care providers, like the volume of their sexually active patients, the volume of their HIV patients, both of which we felt like was probably going to be associated with what they, their likelihood of prescribing PrEP. And then uh, there's sort of a set of network characteristics for each physician's local, local network. That's like their degree, the, the sort of specialized degree, the number of connections that they have to other HIV treating physicians, to infectious disease specialists, to other PrEP prescribers. And then um, embeddedness just a measure of transitive closure um, because we argue that if you're deeply embedded in a group of physicians, your, your behavior is going to be constrained to be like the behavior of those who are surrounding you, right? Those of you who work in the ergum world can see parameters in this that look like ergum type parameters. You have data on who exactly were the infectious disease specialists. Yeah, so we were able to work backwards to determine whether or not their specialty was internal medicine, infectious disease, and so on and so forth. Yeah. And then we include metropolitan standard area, like whether or not it's urban or rural versus suburban. That was our reference category. Uh, and then um, there were some other variables that ended up coming into play because we added census information about the major geographic regions and so on and so forth. So what did we find out? Yes. Um, so I assume because you used regression, you binarized the ties. Did you keep them weighted? You said shared patient between mm -hmm. uh, binaries. So we did them. So we did them in two different ways. Mm -hmm. So we we maintain the data in a full form that has the number of shared patients that they have, um, and then. Uh, we worked with, with a statistician uh, whose name is Josh Embry, who's a student of, thank you, I can't remember his name, it's terrible. Um, I keep wanting to say Mark Fleischer, and that's not, or who did I say Mark Hancock last time? No, Mark Hancock is the right name. The name you said was Mark Newton. Thank you. It's Mark yes. Hancock, So um, to help us come up with some probabilistic representations of the network, and we operated on that too, um, ultimately, Looking at this, though, um, there's you either share a lot of patients with a doctor or you share like one or two. So there's a very bimodal distribution in the probability of you sharing patients. And so it was fairly easy for us to come up with a cutoff that allowed us to dichotomize this and work on it as a, as a sort of um, deterministic network. Right? Yes? I, could have, I should have brought, I had actually a, a diagram of the distribution of the number of PrEP prescriptions in 2016 and 2017. It is incredibly long-tailed, like very, very, very heavy at zero, one, two. And then, because in 2016 and 2017, this was still incredibly new, right? The, the treatment itself was something that was rarely used and was still considered only for gay men at the highest risk injection drug users at the highest risk and sex workers at the highest risk. So basically you get 
zero versus one or two, and then there are like thousands of physicians who are in this very long tail. So that answers your question. Then my Sorry, question. Yes. They have like a margin of like very different from. So what we're doing is we're in the qualitative study. We're identifying these where we started from the tails of the. We're using our model, our predictive model, where we have an an expectation of how much they would be prescribing versus the observation of how much they would be prescribing, and we created lists of people that are at each end of those two different uh, sort of lists, and we've been interviewing them to talk to them about what's different. We will probably do some descriptive assessments of these people because we see them we see them as the the sort of significant positive and negative outliers, and those are the people we want to know the most about. But I mean, from my own experience, the people that you're going to see that are the most highest prescribing are going to be people that are working in the major urban areas that see the largest number of HIV and MSM patients. So you're talking about people in Los Angeles, San Francisco, Chicago, Miami, New York, Boston, like most of those major areas. Yes? The 130,000 patients in sample, means that, that means you're 130,000 out of 500. On prep. Yeah, 130,000 out of the, um, I'll show you the total number, right? Because the number, yeah, 500,000, so 130,000 is about 20%, right? Of the sexually active patients that were included in our sample of physicians that, that treated this in the data that we have. as compared to 7 million individuals that they, we know that they were treating for general herpes. So even, like this says, even acknowledging that most individuals at risk for general herpes would not be indicated for PrEP, there are about 250,000 doctors who are seeing sexually active patients that never prescribed PrEP. That's a huge number of patients, of physicians who at least should know about it maybe should have been prescribing one or two patients. So these are just the numbers uh, basically that were in, in the words in that slide. So no, these are the patients, these are the HIV patients and, and physicians based on who they were treating, patients and physicians who were treating the particular uh, disease HIV, this is pre-exposure prophylaxis, and this is herpes. Just to give you some numbers. But then we did some bivariate analyses because we had this initial, this initial idea that infectious disease specialists would be more likely than their internal medicine colleagues to be prescribing PrEP, and so we did some really simple bivariate analyses, and yes, we can see that most of infectious disease doctors who see sexually active patients do have PrEP patients, but that's not the case for internal medicine doctors. Even though it is now policy or recommendation, NIH recommendation, that they should be able to be treating these PrEP patients. But the original policy was send them to an infectious disease specialist, particularly an HIV specialist, in order to get them on PrEP. Right? So some of this is just a function of the change in policy that we're catching, but that's exactly why we wanted to try to start with the 2016, because that's roughly when the policy started shifting towards a broader access to PrEP. What do we know about the network features? Do internal medicine physicians who prescribe PrEP have a greater centrality generally? Yes, right? We thought that they would be better connected. Do internal medicine physicians who prescribe PrEP have more infectious disease connections? Yes, so they are more connected to infectious disease doctors too if they're prescribing PrEP, which was also one of our hypotheses. 
and are internists who don't prescribe PrEP more embedded? Yes. So we had argued that your behavior would be constrained by heavy sort of engagement in, in sort of clustered physicians. And since the majority of physicians are not prescribing PrEP, being embedded with a larger group of, of, of doctors seems to be associated with behavioral constraint. Right. So we did all of these models before we investigated a big multivariate model. And the way that we did the multivariate models were sort of in a blocked model development approach. So we included information that we knew about the physicians, um, patient characteristics, then their network characteristics, and then information about sort of regionals. Last point. It was, we do not prescribe, the mean ES prep is higher than the mean. That might be. I need to go back and double check. I'm pretty sure that this response is correct. I think that there's just a typo somewhere in here that I need to double check as far as the numbers go. But I'll have to go back and look. So we put the models together and then we use AICC to determine whether or not adding the additional variables to our baseline model improved the fit of the model. So in our preliminary results, we can see significant results for having prescribed PrEP in the year before, having had larger numbers of herpes patients and larger numbers of, of HIV patients in the year before. This is not surprising. Um, we also see that having a greater degree centrality the year before seems to be negatively associated a little tiny bit with prescribing PrEP. We, we, we are sort of hypothesizing that that has something to do with um, sort of this embeddedness idea that your behavior is constrained if you're really popular and you're not going to be trying new things because you don't want to you don't want to take too many risks. But above and beyond your degree centrality, your connections to other infectious disease specialists are no longer significant. But your connections to other physicians who prescribe PrEP itself becomes significant, right? So it's not about knowing an infectious disease specialist, it's about knowing other people that are doing the thing that you are thinking about doing that converts you, right? And then we have a sort of a minor trend associated with uh, being in an area where people have higher use of uh, intravenous drugs. Um, and then all of this stuff about sort of MSM, uh, attitudes towards MSM, whether or not you're living in an urban or rural area, and any of this stuff that has to do with insurance coverage, which we felt like might also drive the behavior, became irrelevant. From a network's perspective, for somebody who studies networks and argues that networks are effective, the fact that we have these very strong network effects that have to do with, with probably social influence gave us, I mean, I think that that's pretty exciting. So those were national level models. We re-ran these models for each of the nine major census areas to see whether or not we saw any variation. And the sign and the magnitude of all of the, of all of the parameters stayed the same, but some of the parameters lost significance just as a function of the size of some of these areas. I'm going to show you a map in the next slide that lets you understand that some of these areas are large enough to have a high proportion, and some of them are not, right? These are the nine areas, by the way. The northeast is the middle Atlantic in New England states, and then we have the south Atlantic, which is basically all the coastal south. East, south, central, which is, I think, I don't know, some of us would consider strange division culturally. Um, and then we have, like, the northern Midwest. West, north, central, west, south, central. You can read the rest of this, right? But this is how the census divides the United States, and we ran it to see whether we, I, to be honest, thought that we were going to see drastic differences between what we saw in, say, the Pacific versus what we saw in the South. So the fact that the models themselves held up fairly well makes us feel like they're, the models are pretty robust. I think I've covered most of this already. Um, we took out the urbanicity variable because we were concerned that it might be sort of catching a bunch of the variants associated with a lot of the other things. Yes? Uh, 
just a minor question. So what did you do with those connections that bridged across? So in the, in the regions that bridged across the areas, um, we did not include the physicians that were at the opposite end of those networks. So if you were internal to the state, then you were included in the network, but you lost your, you lost those connections. That portion of the network. Yeah, but I mean, since many of the models really just included counts, we can include the counts, we just don't include information about the other physicians. Was there quite a lot of uh, modularity in the... So some of the regions have, some of the regions have fairly high overlap. So um, between California and Nevada, there's fairly high overlap. But in some of these other areas, like between Kansas and Oklahoma, not so much overlap. So there's varying degrees of data lost when we divided it up. But not so much that we felt like we were doing a huge disservice to the models. But it's probably worth quantifying at some point because more than one person will probably ask that question, right? So I think I talked about this, right? We removed the urbanicity variable. Um, we also, this is, this is sort of how the AIC changed and improved, right? Um, I should say that most of the work done on these, these predictive models was done by my colleague, Luke Matthews, who has a lot more experience analyzing claims data because he was doing it far before he came to RAND. Um, and he knows more, much more about the about the, de the details of the regressions than I do. So if you have lots of technical questions, I'm not the person to talk to other than that I can take your question and ask him later. So one of the things that we've been concerned about is network dependency. Obviously, we know that all of these counts and all of these eigenvector centralities and everything else that we were calculating are all interdependent with each other. And so we thought about a variety of different ways to do it. Obviously, the permutation approaches like quadratic assignment and, and some of these others are just far too computationally intensive and really focus on structural features beyond what we, I mean, the, too strongly for us, for anything that we wanted to do, right? Um, we also considered link-based models that use random effects for the, for the ends of the links, um, but uh, decided again that they were too strongly focused on structural features and not the behavioral outcomes that we were looking at. Um, we thought about uh, autoregression models, but Luke was concerned that there would be some problems with bias in the parameter estimates. And so what we did was we just created samples, since we had so many, we have big enough data that we just pulled samples after we computed all of our network models, we pulled samples of 10% and just ran the models multiple times and then integrated the responses to give us our parameter estimates and our standard errors in the same way that you would do with a sort of multiple group model in Siena or whatever else. Not fancy, but standard. I should say did do since mm -hmm. did, did y'all consider uh, new auto logistics? No, we did not, but that's something that, so we are at the point now where we're just wrapping up these models and trying to decide what we might be able to do that takes these a step further. So this might be something that we can yeah, look into. I mean, it's essentially an expansion on focusing on which is what this is. So essentially, it is building on the kind of network auto regression. Mm -hmm. Or that matter, Matt Dorian. Right. And uh, what we did before that, we talked about. Right. This is more recent stuff. Yeah. I think that that's probably going to be effective for us. Um, because, again, I think for a very fast study, these kinds of these kinds of regressions are going to be effective, but we also want to make sure that we can that we can try to throw this data at the most cutting edge of the models that we have and see what they do. So, um, and of course, we're aware that there are issues with using claims data to inform physician communication networks. This is this was one of the major concerns that we got from the reviewers. Um, however. We also know that getting that kind of data is much easier and much less expensive than trying to do the kind of survey that you would need to get true communication networks. 
the only other thing we could possibly do is ask permission to scrape their emails, and I don't know whether or not a physician would ever allow anything like that to happen. Um, so, and we know that there are sort of infinite design choices as to what exogenous data to, to integrate, how. Um, we tried to do the best we could with what we knew that we had, given what we needed. Um, we also know that there are issues working from a network projection, right, because we could have done these analyses using the full two-mode network. Um, but since our focus was on patient, was on physician behavior and not on patients, we felt like it was just so computationally expensive and so much more complicated that the, the sort of projection was effective enough for us. Right? Um, and we consider this a step as far a first step that was far less expensive. This sort of gets to what you're saying, Nash, about like we needed to get something done that we could give to the project officer that we could start talking to interventionists about and implementation sciences, and I, pu I put this down here doing the best we can with what we have because that's con that honestly was in the first paragraph of my response to the reviewers because so many of them were, were bringing these issues up and I was like, we gotta do something. This is, let's just let us start and we'll move forward from there. So just a couple of more slides to finish up. What are our next steps? Obviously we're in the process of doing these intervention simulations. Um, I think I talked about those already. We're, we're doing both diffusion studies and these model-based predictions. Um, we're doing what we're calling the systematic, systematic qualitative interviews to assess feasibility and acceptability of the mode of delivery for the information about PrEP. Um, and the, the thing that we think is really cool is that we're using our models to tell us which physicians to contact that fall into each of these categories. So are they high likelihood, high prescribing? Are they high likelihood, low prescribing? Because those are the sort of sources and targets. But then are they low likelihood, high prescribing? Because those we think are the major positive deviants that we need to understand. Like what's motivating them outside of a real patient need to do it? What's motivating them to, to do the prescribing? I can ask a question. Sure. I think you talked about, you said that not so much focus on content intervention instead on they would better target. yeah who to target and how to how to target the information can you tell a little bit more about what kinds of intervention yep. um, what would you sure. say intervention you mean yeah coming up to you and saying hey thank you tell us why you did this or can you talk to so and so what do you what do you mean by intervention so in this context I'm thinking about do, would something that's like a broadcast to physicians. So what if I put an ad about PrEP in JAMA? Or what if I put an ad about PrEP in the flyer materials for a big medical conference? Like let's, what if we just broadcast? How, how much is that gonna cost and how effective would that be, right? Now, what if we targeted that to particular regions that we knew, right? How much less will that cost and how, more, how much more effective would that be? Right, so those are the sort of broadcast level ones, but then it's things like, well, what if someone who is real, it wouldn't be specific physicians or doctors, but types of doctors. What if someone who is a well-connected PrEP prescriber is the person who starts talking very aggressively about this with people in their communities and mentioning it and being sort of more visual or visible in terms of doing what they're doing, um, is that going to give us a bigger bang for the buck, right? So if, if we went out and rather than, you know, trying to train all of the people who could be doing the PrEP prescribing, but we trained specific individuals to be our change agents, to work in the community to do that, how effective would that be? And does it need to be structurally similar individuals and can, or do they need to be important to the people that are in their communities? So that's a sort of more targeted diffusion intervention that we thought about, right? So those are the kinds of things. And I, I mean, I am, I am um, completely willing to say that we are right now at the point of just starting to brainstorm on what the sort of portfolio of delivery mechanisms will be. So Alison Ober is the sort of interve is the sort of implementation science person. And so she and I are talking about what has been done, what could be done, you know, what do we know about network-based interventions? What do we know about general implementation science interventions that have been effective? How do we put those together? And then what do they look like when we're running our simulations? So that's the point where we're at now. 
we're also in the process of doing these qualitative interviews, um, and then hopefully we'll be able to give national and regional recommendations for the various modes being more or less effective. Um, what do we think is great about this? We think that we're among the first to apply this social network approach to look at physician and provider behavior in the context of HIV prevention. We see lots of this in the context of patient behavior. Um, we hope that we are able to give data-driven suggestions for what interventions and intervention modalities could be more effective rather than sort of more qualitative approaches. Um, and we hope that this might facilitate intervention targeting so that it allows people to think about what's going to be effective based on what we've already done with our simulations. And then we'd love to generalize this for use in the context of new medical treatments. And I talk about here, talk here about sort of medication-assisted treatment for addiction, which is another sort of novel approach that has pretty high barriers to entry because of lots of social and cultural issues as well as a lot of medical um, sort of licensure issues that have to be dealt with before you're capable of prescribing MAT. Um, I would be remiss if I didn't talk about everybody that's on the team. So I'm the PI of the study, but Luke, Matthew, and Allison helped me write the proposal. Um, it, was, it was a very, very collaborative and very good, um, and, and continues to be a very collaborative and very good relationship with the leads. And then uh, Eric Storholm, Josh Embry, Josh Traub, Sirica Barrill, and Matthew Mizell have been the sort of research support team that we've had helping us do a variety of different pieces, some on the quantitative side and some on the qualitative side. It's been a dream team to work with. Like, they make my life easy. And, and I can't say more about, I can't say more good things about them. Um, and then we have a really great advisory council. Some of these names, some of you will, meant, you will recognize. So Tom was one of the earliest people to sign on when I told him what I wanted to do. He said, yes, absolutely, tell me what you need. Um, Terry Smith is the director of HIV prevention services for APLA Health. I've known him almost the whole time that I've been living and working in LA on HIV research, so I was thrilled that he would be willing to help us because he really knows how these things work on the ground. Um, Phil Hammock is the chair of the Department of Psychology and uh, director of the Gender and Social, Sexual, Sexual and Gender Diversity Lab at UC Santa Cruz. Um, I wanted to have on here a bunch of people who were experts in the field and also who were very strong advocates for, for the groups that we felt like were at high risk for, for HIV. So that's why Phil's here. Aaron Lord uh, is a neurologist who works at NYU Langone. He also is in charge of uh, the leader of the Prep for All um, sort of campaign, which is fighting to have Ge uh, Gilead release the patent so that it can be provided um, generic. And then Keith Hermanstein, who's a collaborator of mine who works with minority populations who are at high risk for HIV. So um, we wouldn't be where we were. I would not be where I was. I would not be able to stand here in front of you and talk to you about these models if it hadn't been for their feedback and their input in the design and the implementation of the study. Um, and you guys are great because this has been a test drive. Next week, at the end of next week, I actually present all of these findings to them. So thank you so much for giving me the opportunity to talk to you about this today. Thank you. And I'll take questions. I don't know how much longer we have. We have time for a few questions. Yeah. 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 Okay. Um, so thank you so much. I really you're doing here in terms of methods is networks infer rationality. Because I, so m most people in this room know Vater, which is those methods, it's just, we all know also that it's just really data sets like this, no matter how operate higher order and that's enough. should be made with regression analysis and how much better by incorporating this network. Above and beyond. <clears throat> so to say standard regression analysis. Yep. But then I was also thinking that, um, and I have no idea, I'm curious about your opinion, whether you could slice up 
actually in a meaningful way, just to say, take California. Mm -hmm. if, if you can really just defend by cut that population in the way you did, getting rid of some nodes and dies and whatnot, and slice it down to a small enough chunk where you could maybe play the so, so we're doing this. Yeah, so we're doing this um, with the, right now we're, we're um, we sort of have a test bed that we're using to assess whether or not net diffuse R is going to work effectively on the national level data set. And we have just Los Angeles, but we have, in addition to the regional models that we've decided to do, we're also going to do some of the major cities and some key states. So. Indiana, which has, which was red in the map, and Nevada, which was red in the map, and South Carolina, some of these other major areas we want to analyze by state, and then right now we're working on LA, but we also want to do San Francisco, Chicago, Miami, Boston, all of these sort of major areas for which we have been, people have been analyzing this data for a long time, so that we can sort of comment on, on this regionally, and some of those networks, I think, even though they will still be on the order of, you know, hundreds of thousands of nodes in some ways will will be at least, yeah, more manageable. So we're working on that. And we would love to, to continue conversations about what we should try and what we should look into, like these alum models could be good. Yeah. Great job, just. And that's something that has been, I mean, clearly we don't have the data to do that because we don't have any information about the patients themselves. And so we don't know who is, who these people are seeing aside from what we've been able to learn from the interviews that we've been, that we've been doing where people tell us, you know, oh, I work in an HIV clinic. I am, I am, I used to be the prep point person in the clinic, but now it's somebody else. And that's why you have my name as a high prep prescriber, but the whole clinic is overall a high prep prescribing clinic. So. You know, again, this gets to my point of this is a first step to show what we can do in order to argue for if you gave us access to more data and more detail and you trusted us to actually, like, manage all of that sort of HIPAA stuff appropriately, we could do much more, like, answer these kinds of questions that get at 
this transition point between, right? Because like I've said, it's access availability and utilization. And utilization is purely patient focused. Um, I think access is really, or availability is really like producer and physician focused. And then, but this, um, this access piece is the piece where the patients and the providers sort of meet. And we don't, I, I agree, I'm basically agreeing with you that we don't have the right approaches and the right data to figure out the, how those two things work. Um, but I think we could. It just takes allowing them to let us put those things, the data sets together appropriately. I don't know, um, I, this data is in an email, I was literally just reading this email yesterday from the person who's running the, the diffusion studies where he said this is the level of uptake from 2016 to 2017. We ran a bunch of sort of probit analyses to determine what we felt like were the key factors to, to see whether or not we needed to incorporate additional individual level characteristics. So I can tell you that, but not right now because I don't have it right in front of me. How it compares to the uptake of other kinds of, of um, new treatment modalities, I have no idea yet. I think that's something that we should look into to say, well, this is more or less, this is faster, this is less fast. We don't know, because we're just in the process of starting those simulations. Did you do have in your records a physician first prescribed? Well, we know. The first adoption. Well, we don't have, we only have data from 2016 oh, right. and 2017. Right. During, that During that period, non adopters, yeah. we know when in their list of behaviors for sexually active patients, we know when it first happened. So we know when that transition is among those millions of claims, but not anything outside that realm. Okay, well, let me again, uh, let's give another round of applause to Hank. Oh, for... Thank you. Uh, Hank, we have a ripple, something. It's a little bit of an odd question, a little bit of a panic. We can take you back in time. You might need to replace them for your beverage. Uh, Oh, there as well, so the Mississippi. And I know that you have meetings 